Welcome, everybody. This is Ordinary People with Extraordinary Stories. I'm Chana Weisberg, host of this podcast. Today, I'm joined by an amazing guest. I'm so excited to introduce to you all. Her name is Rifki Slenim. Hi, Rifki. Welcome. Hi, Chana. Thank you for having me. Rifki is the Associate Director at the Chabad Center of Jewish Life at Binghamton University. She's an internationally known teacher, activist, lecturer, She's also the author of several books, including Total Immersion, Bread and Fire, and most recently, Holy Intimacy, which is a fabulous new book. She's the author of Holy Intimacy together with Sarah Morozov. And she's also the mother of nine children. Rifki, I'm getting like dizzy just saying all that. How do you manage to juggle all that? Well, look who's talking. (laughs) (laughs) So... uh... You just do it. You just do what you have to do. You just do you what, just you, do have what do. you have to do. I feel very privileged and I'm very motivated by, by the work I do. And I just feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to do what I do. And I thank God for every day that I have. Amazing. Wow. That's beautiful. So, so tell us a little about, you know, your, your reputation precedes you. Um, you're someone who's known as an advocate and an activist for all women's issues. Um, you've even coined the term feminist, a Hasidic feminist. So you've been called that, a Hasidic feminist. Can you tell us, first of all, what does a Hasidic feminist mean? What, what is that to you? It's a woman who understands her worth, um, where she's coming from and where she's going the opportunities that await her, the responsibilities that she has, um, and all of this through the prism and the perspective of Hasidic teachings. Wow. So is it, uh, is it like a, a contradiction in terms to say that a person could be a feminist while being a Torah-observant Hasidic woman? You know, feminism is not a monolith. Uh, there are so many iterations, there are so many varieties, there have been so many permutations and cycles of feminism. But at its core, feminism is about um, fighting the lie, the carnard, that uh, women are somehow less worthy than men. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems that being a Hasidic feminist is the most intuitive type and iteration of feminism, because anybody who's familiar with Hasidic teachings and what Hasidus has to teach knows that that can't possibly be true, that women somehow less worthy uh, or less important to the divine plan uh, than is a man. So to me, it's it's so natural um, and comfortable and intuitive. And I think people just get very scared of the word feminism in certain communities. And people did tell me when I was younger, none of your kids are going to be able to find shidduchim. They're not going to be able to find people to marry them. You're you're putting this terrible stigma on your family by by uh, aligning yourself with feminism or something like that. Um, and then from the other side, there were people like, "Who gives you the right to call yourself a feminist? You're obser- you're an observant Jew." Um, but I've just decided that. That's what I am and that's who I am. And all the detractors are just going to have to deal with it. Great, great attitude. So is there a stigma? Like you said, people were were, were telling you that, you know, you better watch out for this reputation. Why would people feel that way? Why would people feel that there's something contradictory to feminism and Torah or Hasidus? Well, I think that there are strands of feminism, certainly, um, that threw away traditional values, uh, Torah values in wholesale fashion. So I think that the whole name, the whole term, the whole genre of teachings associated with this became tainted by that. Um, But the idea that a woman has important contributions to make, uh, that she's absolutely central, not only to her home, but to society and to the world entire, That I find is absolutely central in Hasidic teachings, certainly in the Rebbe's teachings. Um, And uh, I think that people just, I think think people are beginning to understand that, uh, you know, the way I see it, the the modern uh, feminist 
movement of feminism is actually a reflection of a celestial movement. And as we move closer to the Messianic era, uh, where Kabbalistic and Hasidic sources have long contended that the woman's voice and the feminine energy will rise, uh, we're seeing a, a, an iteration of that. Um, and it's a little bit muddled, and sometimes it's a little bit confused in parts. Uh, and, and some of that, I think, makes people nervous and scared mm -hmm. and fearful. Uh, but I think, you know, the Rebbe was certainly not fearful or afraid of um, vesting women with agency <laughs> and obligation and privilege. And um, I don't see why anybody else should be. Right. I guess people are always afraid of whenever there's any kind of change or movement. Anything new. Anything yeah. new, right? Yeah. Anything revolutionary, anything new that it still should withhold the tr hold on to the traditions. Correct, and I, <clears throat> and, I, and I honor that. I cherish that. I understand that. Right. So, when did this when did this evolve? The Rifki Slunim, who grew up in a somewhat sheltered background in Crown Heights, when did you become um, such an advocate for women, women's rights? It, was this who you always were? How did you develop into who you became? You asked me an interesting question, Hana, and um, to a very large extent, I'm not entirely sure how this happened. I do know that I didn't go looking for anything as much as I found that things came looking for me or finding me, and I just was responding to uh, something I felt I had to respond to. Um, did you so feel I, like, did you have questions about women in Judaism as you were growing up? Is that what led wrote, you to... No, no, growing <laughs> up, I, I grew up in a home that was filled with strong role models, both male and female. Uh, I never felt less than. I never felt that there was anything I couldn't do, frankly. Um, I felt very nourished and nurtured spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. Um, and I came to Binghamton um, at the very tail end of 1984 with my husband. I was 20 years old. Um, and we were both young and very like rah-rah, like we are the Rebbe Shluchim and we are going to see what kind of contribution we can make. Um, so you came was, to Binghamton as, as shluch, to be Shluchim there. You didn't just yes. end up in Binghamton. Did you choose this place? Did you choose Binghamton? Um, or it chose you again? <laughs> well, um, my mm -hmm. uncle, Rabbi Nassim Garari, who's our Hechliach, was looking for Shluchim. Um, to come to the cities of Syracuse, Rochester, Ithaca, and Binghamton, among others. Um, and he was having a harder time finding somebody to go to Binghamton at the time. And as soon as we got married, he started mm -hmm. talking to us about this. Um, and initially, it seemed like a very far out idea. Uh, my husband is Israeli. He doesn't like this, but I, I do refer to him as a Palestinian. His family <laughs> has been um, in, in the Holy Land uh, for seven generations. Um, mm -hmm. And he spoke very little Hebrew, very little English when we got married. And it just seemed like we would most likely end up doing uh, the Rebbe's mission, but in Israel. And Did, uh, did you speak Hebrew? Is that how you communicated? We communicated in Yiddish. My, I guess you my, didn't fight too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, right. whatever you have to say, you could say multiple languages. Um, right. But we we initially communicated in Yiddish, or I would speak to him in English, and he would respond in Yiddish or Hebrew. Interesting. Um, because he he understood a lot more English than he could speak. I understood a lot more Hebrew than I could speak. Right. We both understood Yiddish, um, and we did write a letter to the Rebbe asking <laughs> that there are possibilities um, in Israel. There are possibilities in America. And uh, we were taken aback, and so was everybody who knew about this, when the Rebbe very unequivocally uh, told us that we should stay in the United States of America. Interesting. And at, wow. that point, <clears throat> at that point, Binghamton became more of a possibility, but it still wasn't really first on the list. Again, it seemed like that would be somewhat counterintuitive um, for my husband in terms of his background and so on and so forth to go on to an American campus. Mm -hmm. um, but here we are. Uh, wow. So that's, that's our so, story as to how we came to Binghamton. So you came to Binghamton as a 20 year old, as a young, young, newly married woman. Um, and your students, I'm assuming were even older than you. How, how did that make you feel? The or the same the, age, the same the age and older. Yeah, the juniors and seniors were um, older than I was mm -hmm. at the time. 
Um, but I think from their perspective, they probably thought I was 10 or 15 years older than them because I was married to a man mm -hmm. who had facial hair that always puts a few years <laughs> on you. Um, and we already had a child who was a few months old. And so wow. I think in their perception, uh, I was much older than they were. Um, from my perspective, I was very intimidated. Uh, I was very intimidated by the academy. I was intimidated by the students. Um, so funny. I can't imagine a Rifki Sledem intimidated. So that's interesting. <laughs> well, you, 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 come, you come into a new, you come into a new oh, environment. Sure. Um, and I had always loved ideas, loved reading. Um, and I think I had a very romanticized idea of what a university is and what the academy mm -hmm. is and is not, uh, which I was uh, disabused of. Uh, but it took some time. Uh, so, yeah, it was intimidating. And then there was an additional layer, and that was that I found myself at times pummeled with questions about women in traditional Judaisms. Uh, in traditional Judaism, at times I felt myself attacked. Um, and at times... Can I, I just ask, how long ago sure. was this? How long ago was this, like approximately? How long are you Nin there? 1985. 1985. We're, yeah, we're, we're coming close <clears throat> to 40 years. Wow. Um, wow. So, yeah. So go ahead. Whole... You felt yourself attacked by questions? Questions. On... Questioning every single premise that I held dear. Um, let's just say that if there were certain ideals and certain um, principles that formed the box of my life, mm -hmm. uh, these questions were coming certainly from outside of the box. Um, but I, I learned that they were coming from outside almost of any framework. In other words, the, I was used to a frame where certain things were inviolable. And uh, these questions were coming from a place where, where nothing um, has to be, uh, where everything is up for grabs. And uh, it was quite the experience um, to have all kinds of texts cherry picked and thrown at me. And what do you say about this? Or how, could, how do you understand that? And uh, that was what launched me on my own personal journey, because um, I knew that what I had grown up with, and I knew that what I believed, and I knew that what I had was precious and um, pure and true, uh, but I had to understand how that all could be squared with certain texts, um, certain ideas, some of which I had known about, but many of which I had never seen. How, you know, where does that fit into the context? And that did put me into a, I would say, philosophical and theological spin for, for a little bit. Um, and I'm very fortunate. I had all kinds of people around me uh, whom I could question endlessly. They were very patient. Um, it, it really threw me into study in a very, very different way. And I basically had to re, um, <clears throat> regain my standing, or you could say that own it all in a whole new way. And mm -hmm. actually your um, uncle, uh, Rabbi Dr. Emanuel Shachar of Blessed Memory was a very important mentor and a very important teacher. And um, he never tired of my questions, even when <laughs> he wanted to lose his patience, he, he didn't. Uh, and can, I'm, very, I'm very thankful for that. I, I will never wow, forget that. That's beautiful. That kindness. Wow, that's nice to hear. Uh, can you give us an example, some examples of what kind of questions you were feeling, you were fielding at the time that you felt were difficult to answer and that you now understand differently? Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even know where to begin. Right, uh, there's but, so much. But, but um, you know, there were some kind of abrasive, negative statements about women's Torah study. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big thing. And that has to be understood in context, has to be understood in the context of where it's found in the Talmud. Uh, one has mm -hmm. to understand what, you know, how the Talmud is written, and how it's not. Let's just say it's not a woke tract. Um, and sometimes I feel like it's an equal opportunity offender. And, you know, when you understand that, you don't take everything as personal. That's a cute phrase, like, equal opportunity offender. I like that way. Uh, you know, you, you <laughs> mean, it says it very straight, very, very to yeah, the point. Yeah, and there mm -hmm. are abrasive uh, statements made about men and women 
and kings and slaves and, and everybody. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. that, well, that's one. Mm-hmm. The other is to understand how things, how the Torah and how Jewish law responds to sociological changes mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, I was uh, breastfeeding my child at the time and uh, I had young women talking to me about how, you know, breasts was something that women uh, came to grow through evolutionary process because society foisted the task of feeding the young upon women and so on and so forth. And, you mm-hmm. know, when I look back at a younger iteration of myself, uh, there were times where I would spend two or three nights a week up all night, you know, uh, trying to respond to these questions. Um, and today I would say to somebody who had these questions, I'll talk to you in five or 10 or 15 years because I, because I understand so much more that some things you just have to come to through life experience, you know, uh, like the Hebrew expression, my mother uh, always says that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. so, so, so there, there are things that one needs to learn from books Right. And there are many, many things that we can only learn from life, from experience and from modeling, from what's modeled for you. And so I, I try to be there for my students today. And I've tried throughout throughout the years to just model my truth. I, I've always been drawn to truth and realness. Mm-hmm. So I just try to be real and true and try to do my best. Beautiful. Do you think and, that do you think the questions have changed over the years? Like, have you seen a difference in that, or the attitudes have changed? Yes, and yes, everything has changed. Right. And how everything do you? In what way? And how do you respond to that? It, in almost mm-hmm. all ways, um, I would. Well, there are there are a number of things. Um, when I came onto campus students were much more engaged with causes. So feminism was just one of many causes, but people were engaged in causes. Over the years, that kind of waned. It didn't take very long for it to wane. And it was more about getting in and getting out with your degree and going to next, whatever that next might be. Mm. But there was none of this dawdling in, you know, at a university for more than four years because you were trying to get this or that or that done. Like parents won't stand for that today and kids are not that interested. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's one change. Um, another change is that maybe, at, at, you know, at a certain point in, in feminine, it's, it's almost it's almost comical because sometimes uh, some of my closest alumni who I know have gone through medical school, they've gone through law school, they've, they, whatever it is they've achieved. And then they'll tell me, well, you know, I just decided I really didn't want to work. I want to be home with my kids. And I'm like, wait, really? Like after all of that training? No, I think you should do something in your field. And it's kind of like the roles and they're like reverse, right? And I'm like, no, no, no. I don't think you should give up motherhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you should have another two kids, but I also think you should be practicing in your field. I do Mm -hmm. believe that. Um, So I think women in a certain sense have more latitude today because they don't have to prove as much anymore. We know a woman could get through medical school and law school. We know a woman could be a neurosurgeon. We know a woman could be anything she wants to be. It's kind Mm -hmm. of a shame that America doesn't have, uh, you know, a woman as president yet where we're Mm -hmm. behind many countries. And that that's, that's a blight on our record as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, but if a woman doesn't want to do that, she doesn't have to feel compelled in the same way that women, I think, maybe in the 80s felt. Right. So, that, wow. so that's been interesting. Um, and, but I, but no, but nobody's attacking breastfeeding anymore in the same mm-hmm. way. And even in this woke world, you know, I remember very, very vividly um, when we felt like we had made it, we had this like big facility and now we had two bathrooms and we put up these signs that said men and women and I remember getting attacked for women w-o-m-e-n uh, by a young woman who felt it should be w-o-m-y-n there shouldn't be the word men in the word women oh my gosh wow well wow. no that was that, that was a real thing you know right. like history well where's her story Mm-hmm. Why history mm-hmm. and right. so on and so forth. So we're not living in that, um, in that zealousness in the same mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Because so, we you... take many things for granted. I mean, right. and, and we, and we have to be cognizant and I think appreciative of the women who fought for so much we take for granted. 
Right. And at the same time, I feel somewhat ironically and paradoxically that there are so many ways in which women are still not taken seriously enough. And that I would say the secular world is actually lagging behind the Hasidic world, as crazy mm-hmm. as that sounds. Because you feel that the Hasidic world takes women more seriously or more values them more? Because if you are 1 million percent convinced that God created this world, that God doesn't make mistakes, then you know that the world needs both energies, female and male, and that is Mm -hmm. not one, it's both. Mm -hmm. They have to work in tandem. There are things we have to achieve. Each one of us has strengths and it's all necessary. And if you take that seriously, then uh, everything else kind of falls into line. I have a friend who was once uh, coming to see me and she was waiting in the lobby for me till I came to get her. And um, my son happened to be on the phone. And as he was on the phone, he was braiding the hair of one of his daughters. And when she saw me, she said, oh, my God, Rivki, I, I, I can't believe what I just saw. Levy was braiding his daughter's hair. And I was like, wait, Rhonda, what's like, what are you exclaiming about? But to her, a Hasidic man braiding his daughter's hair, to he me, do that. that's, that's natural and intuitive. So mm-hmm. if that's what he has to do at that moment, because his wife is doing something else, for instance, you know, and they're not raising the kids separately. They're raising the kids together with all that that entails. Hmm. So I think when you're mission driven, it's not about positioning and it's not about limelight. It's about getting it done. I guess it's also about not how you look at women only, but how you look at men and women and how they work in tandem to do, as you're saying, their mission and what they have to do in life. Right. Their when, purpose. When you, when you, <clears throat> right, exactly. When you change it from where do I find meaning to mm-hmm. what is my purpose? When you change that question, everything changes. So, you know, I, I found it interesting. You're talking about women, about this this friend of yours who you're telling her to go back to some area of her field, even though she wants children. And yet you had nine children and you were doing so much. How did you manage that? How did you balance that? But that's exactly what I'm telling my friends now. I'm saying you can do this. Um, First, first, I think we can all do a lot more than we think we can do. Um, And that's another thing the Rebbe taught us. I mean, that's that that is 100 percent a gift from the Rebbe. You know, do you feel that something something suffers when you do it all? that something is going to be lacking, that some some area of your life is going to suffer and has to give when you're balancing so much? I don't like the word suffer. Um, it's all about what you prioritize. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, you're not going to have a lot of time to watch TV. You're not going to, you may not have a lot of time to go for a mani-patty if that's, you, if, if that's your thing uh, or go, whatever, to a spa. Um, there, there's no um, surplus time in my life. That is true. Um, but I have no regrets. I mean, do I really want to spend like what months or years of my life watching somebody else's fictional life on a screen or do I want to live my life? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I don't think it's about suffer. And um, certainly there are times where it can get overwhelming. And um, there are certainly times where you feel very conflicted and very contorted because there are things at home that need you and there are things at work that need you. Um, but I think knowing that all of it is part of your purpose in this world is a great gift. Mm -hmm. I I think nowadays women feel so pulled in so many different directions because they're doing so much that they feel that they are compromising on certain areas because they've taken it all on. But you seem to be very at peace with your different roles and your different um, responsibilities. I am at peace. I see it as uh, all of one cloth. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't see it as two compartments. This is what my soul has to accomplish here. This is mm-hmm. why God brought me into the world. Right. And I have to I have to just say, you know, I have to, I must say that I saw this modeled. You know, my mother had a larger family than I have in terms of how many children. Um, worked outside of the home and was extremely involved in all things communal. And I can tell you that there was a time where the Rebbe um, asked my mother and a few other people to come into his study and to work on a very special project. And he told her to spend 
25 hours a day on it. 25, 25 hours 20, a week. 25 hours a day. A day. Okay. A day. A okay. 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 And, and she had many children at the time and many other responsibilities. And I think I learned a lot just from watching her. Hmm. Interesting. You know, yeah. it just, the Rebbe felt that we could do it. You know, we could do a lot more. We shouldn't limit ourselves. We shouldn't uh, circumscribe ourselves to, to, to a limited space. And, right. and you grow, you grow that way. You break out of your old box and, and you grow a larger box and then you have to break out of a larger box. And Right, right. Well, um, <clears throat> tell us a little about like, what, what does your day look like? I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, like, what do you, what does she do all day? Like, what is how does she manage it all? Well, uh, please, please, I'm hardly the most <laughs> busy person in the world, and uh, let's not over romanticize anybody's existence. <laughs> um, what's my day like? Um, I'm I'm very privileged. I do a lot of teaching, uh, which is my drug of choice. I absolutely love sharing ideas. I absolutely love getting questions, which um, puts me back into more research and allows me to learn more. Um, so I do a lot of teaching. I do counseling. I do administrative uh, planning. We have quite a large operation here. Uh, there's just a lot of aspects to my day. Uh, I do a fair amount of um, counseling, both with the students that are here, alumni, um, fellow shluchos, um, just people that call me. Wow. And how have you seen Binghamton change over the years, like your or your, your job change over the years, your responsibilities change over the years from when you came? And I guess there was just a few people around your t- kitchen table to today where it's like a huge operation. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> it's it's uh, it's grown over the years. We we started with probably three or four or five students around our dining room table on Shabbos. Yeah. Uh, to date, an average Friday night, we'll see close to 600 kids coming through the doors, um, whether mm-hmm. you know they're, they're coming for dinner or they're coming afterwards to hang out or for dessert. Um, we could accommodate around 520 um, sitting for dinner. Um, so, and, and it's not just about Friday night. It's about the scope, um, the breadth and the and the and the width and the length of the organization in in many many different ways uh we have three other couples that um have joined us at chabad of binghamton we need more uh Mm. honestly and we need a lot more staff um and uh it's been a wild ride and in and in many many ways and i think that i i in this way we probably mirror many many other shluchim and shluchais who think to themselves the Rebbe was brilliant in sending us where we are when we were very young, mm-hmm. very naive. <laughs> had no idea, no what idea you're what this was into. Like. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. I-, I guess your husband learned English well. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. But, okay, you so know, it could have been very intimidating. It could, it could have been course, paralyzing. Of course. Of course. But since we were so young and stupid and idealistic and, you know, you just chomping did it. at the bit. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so you have a lot going on for you in Binghamton in your roles there and your many different roles that you juggle. So what propelled you to get into your writing career and to write the books that you did, including your latest one, which is Holy Intimacy? I, I want to talk a little bit more about that book as well. Yeah, um, mm. I never set out to write anything. Uh, I, I still don't think I'm a strong writer. Um, but what happened was, um, I think it was a almost a year after we arrived in Binghamton, my husband was going to the international conference for Shluchim, for the Rebbe's emissaries, the men. Um, and there were two choices. I could either stay here with my baby or I could go with him and just spend the weekend with my parents, which would have been lovely, and my siblings. And I decided I was going to stay here. And um, I decided I was going to do something very special for young women. And so what would be very special? I decided I would do a Friday night dinner and, um, you know, do a little bit more menu wise. And we would do a discussion on love, sex and marriage. I figured who's a college age kid who's not going to be interested in that. And uh, that was a good guess. Um, And the evening uh, went very well. Um, And I guess uh, a colleague of mine heard about it in a different city. And uh, a few months later, she asked me if I could come speak there. And I was like, I don't know. I you know, um, but I did that and it kind of snowball, snowballed. And uh, I started speaking um, on the topic of 
mikvah, the institution, and, um, you know, family purity, as the mitzvah is called. Um, and at a certain point, uh, after meeting hundreds, maybe thousands of people, I felt like something is wrong because there is nothing that gives voice um, mm -hmm. in book form to the real feelings of people who are doing this mitzvah, which does take a commitment. Uh, so all there was available were books filled with laws, the details, mm -hmm. and they were very, very didactic, uh, but there was nothing about where, where's the soul in all of this and where's the humanity and right. where are the couples that are keeping this. And um, that's how I started on my first project, um, which we named Total Immersion. And I was very, very fortunate uh, to have the assistance of a, a very good friend, a soul sister, Liz Rosenberg, who teaches still still teaches at Binghamton University, um, mm -hmm. is a renowned writer and poet. And I am privileged and humbled to call her my writing teacher. Um, and so she helped me with that first collection. And that was a very interesting experience. I think she would say the same thing because mm -hmm. we came from very, very different backgrounds. Um, and it was very, very useful, actually, because she was like the kind of the target audience uh, mm -hmm. for for this book. Um, so that's how the first uh, the first project happened. Um, some years later, I started to feel the same way about Jewish women in Jewish law in life. Um, again, there was a lot of discussion about what halacha, what Jewish law says about this, what Jewish law says about that, how to frame and give context to Talmudic or Mishnaic teachings and so on and so forth. But I didn't feel that there was a book um, that really gave voice to an eclectic group of women and how they were relating to God in their everyday. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so again, uh, Liz and I worked together on a uh, a book we called Bread and Fire, Jewish Women Find God in the Everyday. Mm -hmm. um, so you would and, think that all your bases are covered now. You have women in, in, in life, you have the special mitzvah of mikvah, then how, how did holy, holy, uh, holy intimacy come about? Uh, so in the process of speaking publicly on the subject of family purity, I found myself becoming the address for a lot of people who are calling me with issues having to do with sexual intimacy, um, more detailed uh, questions uh, that they felt uncomfortable asking. And some of them actually called me and did not introduce themselves. And that's mm -hmm. fine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and with time, it became very apparent that I was answering uh, questions that I had been fielding on campus for many, many years. And now I had women from much more traditional backgrounds uh, with the same questions. And it also became clear that again, there was no book in the English language that spoke to this in a real visceral way. Mm -hmm. um, and people were turning to other sources, namely the internet, as see what can I find online? Uh, that's very convenient. I could do this in the privacy of my bed, in my bedroom, um, and I could surf the net and I could get on blogs and chats and see what other people are saying. And um, there's a lot of good information out there and there's a lot of misinformation out there. And um, at the same time, my first cousin and close friend, we had always been very close, Sarah Marazov and I, um, she started telling me, you know, she is, she, she is, I would say the Dean of all, uh, Kala teachers, all the women who prepare brides for marriage within the Chabad community. Um, and, and she would call me, we would, we were comparing notes and we we're like, we're dealing with the same issues. Um, and it was during COVID when we, and she said to me, you know, you need to do like a Facebook live. And I was like, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on social media, and I don't really think I'm getting in there that space right now. Um, but what about if we do a book together, which we did? And so Holy what, Intimacy is the, is the result. Wow. Uh, what is some of this, some of the misinformations or some of the things that you were trying to address in the book? Well, 
let's put it this way, rather than going into details, which anybody who's interested can buy the book, it's easily available on Amazon. Um, I would say that what we hope to have accomplished with the book is break down this false dichotomy between sexual intimacy and holiness. Mm. And we find that that, that, was, that was just a very, very bad, I would almost say dangerous, pernicious place for people to be, for them to think that this part of their life is somehow operating outside of the framework and the rubric of, of everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, in other words, it's one thing for a woman to commit to go to the mikvah every month and to um, commit to the requisite <laughs> abstinence that marks that cycle of two weeks during her period and for a week after abstaining and then going to the mikvah and, and being together with her husband sexually. It's one thing to commit to that. It's another to understand the holiness of intimacy and the important place of pleasure and the way in which this is a gift from God to us Mm -hmm. and the way in which it's part of a larger framework. So that I think is the most important contribution. I guess that's why you call the book Holy Intimacy. You're bringing that holiness into into intimacy. So if you could encapsulate the message that you'd want young people to know about intimacy, what would you say? <clears throat> One thing I could say is that um, imagine if intimacy is a gem, it needs to it needs a good setting. It needs to be set properly so you can appreciate the gem and you could showcase the beauty of the gem. And what does that mean? <clears throat> That means that there's nothing casual about intimacy. It is a very precious gem. But in order for it to be appreciated, it needs a certain setting. It needs a certain framework. It needs a certain contour. Otherwise, you lose the preciousness. You lose the depth. You lose the colors. You lose the cuts. Wow. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's today... Even for young people who've grown up in very, very traditional settings and backgrounds, the whole world is at your fingertips and you're getting so many different messages about what could be fun and exciting to try. And it's sometimes hard to remember that there are things in life that need to be treated in a very specific way in order for them to be not only efficacious, but nourishing and, and, and a fountain of riches for you. And wow. if you don't, if you don't do that, you're, you're squandering something very precious, perhaps the most precious gift that God has given us. That's so beautiful. the book is, the book is not just, so the, so the, so the book really the thesis of the book is you can't separate sexual intimacy from emotional intimacy, which is found in marital intimacy which is found in a larger framework of why do we get married and so on and so forth. Right. So it's wow. layers and layers. It's layering and contextualizing and framing this aspect of our life. Beautiful. And, and all without using platitudes and euphemisms. It's very practical. It's, it's, it's filled with very deep and beautiful ideas and at the same time, very down to earth attentiveness to the, to the quotidian, to the everyday, you know, we, we don't try to kind of make believe everybody's life is perfect. And we talk about difficulty and dysfunction and, uh, and so on and so forth. What, what kind of feedback have you been getting from your book? <clears throat> We've been getting some overwhelmingly amazing feedback. Um, imagine. A lot of people have said, you saved my marriage, <clears throat> or I wish I could have read this 40 years ago or 25 years mm. ago, or everybody should get their daughters to read this when they're in high school before, you know, don't wait until they get married. Don't wait until they're ready to get married and so on and so forth. So we've been very, very positively um, 
surprised, really, because as much mm. as we knew this was important, you know, we, we uh, I have to say we readied ourselves for a lot of criticism, uh, for speaking so openly about topics that were... Do you think perhaps, these topics should be spoken about openly? I don't think <clears throat> we have a choice. I, I think that question is completely academic. Right. And, and, and that's the point. Um, but, uh, we, we, you know, we, we felt that tension and we undertook this project with trepidation, mm -hmm. um, but the trepidation about not doing it, the anxiety about not doing that, doing it won out. And we figured if we are criticized and if we are ostracized and whatever happens to us, if we're punished, <clears throat> we'll, we'll have to take it for the team. But it came to a point where we felt like we, we, Again, it, like it's a project that found us. We didn't go looking for it, but we just felt we could not, not do this. Right. <clears throat> you know, Rifki, I especially wanted to do this interview now during the the time when the world is in such a turmoil, because I thought increasing in holiness and intimacy is so important right now in our current situation. How do you feel about that? I certainly feel the turmoil. It's roiling all around me. Um, I'm on a campus and it's not Berkeley. It's not NYU. It's not one of the Ivy Leagues. Um, it's not the most left-leaning campus. Um, but this is a time of, of great anxiety for all of our young people. Um, we've all been ejected, young and old, from that illusory bubble of safety and security that we felt as North American Jews, as Western Jews. Um, there is a lot, a lot of, I would say, disappointment and even a sense of deep betrayal um, on the part of, of, of Jewish students. They were there for their friends. Uh, they, they were there alongside of them and we are all the social warriors now. Um, Absolutely. There's there's just a lot going on, and even on campus like Binghamton, where God, thank God, we're so privileged. The administration here is so supportive, and so on and so forth. But still, there are anti-Semitic things being said mm. and incidents, and um, it's a difficult time. And it's it's also a time that is further showcasing the erosion of tradition. And, and the tie to Judaism that has been happening over the last few decades. And it's now all coming into sharp relief because students that are not firmly tethered to tradition, frankly, they're not going to care that much about Israel. And they are the prime target for all the propaganda about how, how Israel is a colonist and apartheid and genocidal and, and all of this gibberish, it speaks to them because a Jew is always attentive to the underdog. That's somehow in our DNA. Uh, it, it seems so to me that almost every social movement has been helmed by Jews. <coughs> um, and so it speaks deeply to them. And the state of Israel doesn't have the resonance with them that it had for their parents or their grandparents. Neither does the tie between a Jew and the Holy Land that comes out of our Torah speak to them because unfortunately so many are so far removed. Um, so the urgency of our work is, is, is on such, such display right now. And if anything, I get up every single day with, with greater resolve to do more. Um, and the fact that our our, you know, our organization has grown, it doesn't, doesn't really give me any solace. It has to be so much larger. You know, there are 3,500 kids on this campus. So if five or 600 are here for Shabbat, and let's say there's another 100 at Hillel, and there's another 150 at Chabad downtown, but there's still a few thousand kids that are not anywhere on Friday night. Wow. Um, and, 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 you know, the Rebbe spoke about this so many years ago. And when he spoke about this, I remember as a child listening to him say with such great passion that there is a fire, that the house of Israel is literally on fire and there is no time to stop and think, am I going to take this photo album or that piece of art out? We have to act with alacrity and with urgency. And I think that even Hasidim at the time really didn't understand 
what the Rebbe was saying. And now we see the dire results of the assimilation, the intermarriage, uh, the wholesale defection and disaffection. And um, it's, it's very, very, very sobering. It's, it's alarming. And um, I'm hoping that for at least a segment of, of young Jews and older Jews, it will make them come back, really. Wow. And understand mm-hmm. that the liberal space is, is not a home for them. Um, but uh, it's tragic <clears throat> that I had to take this. And I'm not convinced that this is going to be enough even. And it only makes me more motivated to continue to do what we can here in terms of, you know, there's different ways of teaching. There's teaching classes. There's modeling you know, every Shabbat dinner is a classroom, really, mm-hmm. you know, and so we have to model Jewish life, we have to model the pride, the joy, um, the living, pulsating Torah that belongs mm-hmm. to every Jew, whether they know it or they don't. That's a lot of work, a lot of work. to wow. Rifki, <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us. I think you are modeling to so many what it means to be present and being in this world at this time and following the Hasidic teachings and the Torah teachings. So thank you for all that you're doing in all the realms of the so many different realms, whether it be through your activism, through your teaching, through your writing, through the many things that you do. Um, It was a privilege to have you here. We really appreciate your time and continue going strong because what you're doing is is remarkable, really remarkable. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, this has been a lot of fun to have this conversation. And uh, thank you for all your spectacular work. I enjoy uh, the, you know, the women's site that you helm tremendously. There's um, wonderful content and so much to nourish the mind, the heart, the spirit. And again, never have we needed that more than today. So thank you for that. Wow, that interview with Rifki Slana was amazing. I think what most touched me about the interview was her description of how she came to Binghamton as a young girl, 20 years old, and some of her students were even older than her. And you know, you're in such a position, you can often feel inhibited, but it's that inhibition and that's that challenge that actually propels you to grow. And I guess it was that challenge that propelled her in so many areas of her life to grow, to research, to come to understandings, to be the activist and the amazing person that she is today. So thank you for watching. If you enjoy watching this podcast, uh, you can get these podcasts delivered to your inbox by subscribing to Chabad.org forward slash Extraordinary. We are also streaming on all podcast streaming platforms, so you can catch us there if you're driving in your car or you're doing exercise or whatever. Um, Also, please make sure to leave us some feedback. We really love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining Ordinary People with Extraordinary Stories.